Hi folks, welcome to this week's session where I'm going to be doing a polemic, I'm going to be making an argument and what I'm going to be arguing through our session is that schools don't just have discrimination that happens within the schools but actually indeed schools exist to perpetuate social divides and for that reason we're really very very lucky to have a ex-colleague and very good friend of mine, Dr. Karen Graham here today. And I'm gonna be talking to her about some of the research that she conducted recently, which connects really very brilliantly to uh, today's session. So I think without further ado, we'll get straight on to introduce ourselves to Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, okay. Hello. See you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So do you want to just start by um, just saying a bit about who, who you are? I'm Karen Graham. Um, as Keith said, I um, former colleague of Keith used to share an office with him at Newman University. Very much miss sharing an office with Keith and other colleagues. Um, I am what you might call a academic stroke practitioner, stroke activist, I guess. I have a doctorate in education that I earned from the University of Birmingham um, in 2015 for a piece of research that I did um, around the school experiences of men that go to prison. And since doing that research, I've taught at universities, uh, new men obviously, um, I'm working with children, young people and families and also criminology. I've also taught um, education studies at Manchester Met University and sociology at Worcester. Great. So can I just ask a question then? So um, in your introduction, you very helpfully outlined some of your experience. You mentioned that you did some doctoral research about um, men, prison, schooling, and that's really kind of the nub of what we're looking at today. We're going to talk about that in much more detail, but would it be OK just to briefly start by just saying what it is you were looking at? and how maybe you went about finding that stuff out? Yeah, so um, first thing to say is that um, the idea for this research came from um, my very first teaching experience that I did way back in um, 2001, um, which was teaching in prison. So I taught at HMP Birmingham, I taught maths to men um, there, and then also taught in HMP Stafford afterwards. And I noticed some things during my practice. So I actually wasn't thinking about research at all at this stage. I was teaching and going about my regular professional practice, but made some observations while I was working that made me think about there was some potentially something about the educational experiences of people in prison and a link to their prison, um, the fact that they were in prison, but also their prison experience. And by this, I meant I thought that there was something happening that was different to what might be considered the obvious link between education and prison, which is when people don't do so well at school or get excluded from school or have other negative experiences at school. It, that can limit their life opportunities and increase the possibility that they might engage in offending for as an alternative source of income or for other reasons. Um, that perhaps is obvious and there's quite a bit of research to suggest that there may be that correlation between negative school experiences and offending and therefore um, time in prison. But I thought there was there was potentially something else going on um, that was specifically to do with the actual experience as opposed to the outcomes coming from education. So the outcomes normally are qualifications or lack of. Um, it's what often is, is talked about. Um, with regards to anybody coming out of school, but particularly with groups that don't do so well at school. What I did is I, I, I thought, I don't know what that is, but I think there's something. I went to um, universities of Birmingham, as I said, and I was encouraged by professors there to read a great deal um, around this issue. And in doing so, um, reintroduced myself to sociological theories of education Sociological, critical sociological theories of education that look at actually um, the role that school systems and education systems play in 
actually creating inequalities. So this was my literature. Those of you that um, you know read for your essays or read for your research will do a certain amount of reading to inform your thinking. And this is what I was doing. Combined with that, I decided what I would do was speak to um, the experts in this area and the experts in this area are men who have been to prison. So I interviewed 11 men, former prisoners, um, about their educational experiences. And I did so without kind of presupposing what I would find. So I didn't have a set of questions where I thought, I think this is happening, let me try and prove or work out whether that's what's happening. What I did instead was do um, a very grounded approach to research and used a life history method. So I just asked the, each of the participants to tell me about their schooling. You know, I might, might have asked them clarifying questions, um, prompts to keep them talking or things that were interesting, but I didn't, as I say, go in with a, set of predefined things that I wanted to look at. Um, so through doing that, people told me about their schooling experiences. And although there were 11 different men, different ages, um, very different ages, um, so they were talking about school experiences from very different eras. Um, some people went to school in the 50s, some in the 80s, and a range in between. A number of themes came out of those interviews that suggested that there was a shared a somewhat shared experience in experience of schools and schooling for um, people that go to prison and this um, resonated with what I'd observed whilst teaching in prison now Keith I'm aware that I've I've talked a lot and I can't actually remember what your question was so what I asked was uh, what was it you were kind of looking for why did you uh, do that? How did you go about that? And I think you've, I think you've done a, a, a good job of answering that. So you, you spoke to a group of men. It really interesting, actually, just to pick up on uh, one of the points you made. And I think from, from knowing you, it was a very deliberate point about talking about the experts in the field. And that was the men that were having those experiences. I think that, that speaks to a very clear philosophical position that you have um, and I think that's probably just worth drawing that out so so you went and spoke to the men and um, do you want to just talk a little bit about then what were some of the key findings I know that in discussions I've had with you and I should just declare that Karen and I have you know had some really interesting discussions in the past and I've learned loads from Karen in those discussions with some of the connections between practices within school and how they parallel practices in prison but also I think and again picking up on a point that you just made a minute ago about some of the experiences within school um, how they lead to a particular trajectory a particular path that, that seems to kind of have though the consequences of incarceration I, I know one of the words that's often used is um school to prison pipeline so maybe kind of talk talk around some of all of that stuff if you if you want to it's quite a common phrase that people um talk about these days the school to prison pipeline but when i was doing my research not that long ago i started my research in the early 2000s um it wasn't a phrase that i was familiar with so all that i've just described came from as i say professional practice and observations and when I started reading, I was interested to read this term, um, school to prison pipeline. And most of the work um, then and now actually still um, is based in the US. This concept of the school to prison pipeline talks about perhaps some of the things that I've already mentioned, how having a particular experience of, of school may lead on a trajectory, of, as you've just said, Keith, to negative outcomes that can include um, going to prison, for instance. In the US in particular, alongside that, um, the scholarship grew out of a real concern of uh, school-based police officers and their role in disciplinary processes in US schools. So increasingly, rather than 
if there was a behaviour infraction at school that you would be used to, that either a teacher would deal with that or you'd go to the principal. Instead, the school-based police officer would take ownership of that behaviour infraction. And as a result of that, and other linked no um, zero tolerance policies, both in the criminal justice system and in schooling in the US, was literally leading to young people in school um, getting criminal records for things that were school-based behavioural problems. So that, that, that outside of that, for instance, if, um, as is common, phone, mobile phones are not allowed in school, um, this would be something that might um, warrant a detention or some other sanction, usually. Given that this is breaking of school rules, this could then um, trigger a harsher response from the um, internal school police officer. If the child involved is um, already involved with the criminal justice system outside of school, this could trigger something that literally could could take them into court and then um, onto prison. So this idea of pipeline in the American sense um, was very much around the linking of the criminal justice system and the school system directly in this way. So it was literally pushing people through this pipeline directly into the criminal justice system as the two systems were enmeshed. That was an interesting and disturbing concept actually. Um, but also it helped me to think about different ways in which this is happening. So the way I've just described is a very clear kind of set of policies and almost legal pathways that, that turn something into, into the criminal justice system. And by the way, there is, that, there, are, there is more scholarship developing in the UK around that at the moment, um, just to say that. But what I was interested in was Again, something a bit more nuanced, um, something a bit more subtle, if you like, but the subtlety of it potentially makes it quite a bit more powerful because the subtlety of the ways in which schooling arguably prepares all of us to become citizens of the future, if you like, is not necessarily as explicit as, for instance, um, a maths curriculum or a science curriculum or other things that we are assessed on formally. So there, there are sociological arguments around what school does to all of us, as I've just said. Um, you know, they're very traditional Marxist arguments, for instance, that education spreads um, ideology that is... Um, to benefit the elite and ruling classes. There are several other similar basic arguments uh, around education. So the particular one um, that I found resonated with, with what I started to hear in my interviews with the, the men was this from um, Marxist scholars in the 80s, Bowles and Gintis, who did a study on working class children in schools in America and noted um, and argued that the nature of their school experience was preparing them for a similar experience in their adult working life. So um, what Bowles and Gintis argued was that the way that the schooling system was set up the relationships between that were set up between educators and pupils between pupils themselves each other created an environment that looked very much like the environment of a factory for instance so they um, had lots of mundane repetitive tasks to complete over and over with a there was a great deal of concern around how much movement the the students didn't do so it was kind of trying to restrict their bodily movements how much noise they made, that the authority of the, the teacher was something really to be understood over everything else. And by comparison, when looking at the schooling of middle-class children, they were given much more um, freedom to express opinions, to decide for themselves the nature of the work, 
And overall, I guess Bowles and Gintis argue that what schooling is doing is preparing the working class children to be bossed. So they understand that they are um, under the authority of particular people and they must um, do what they say, regardless if, if what they say is very stupid. And on the other hand, the middle class children were um, taught to be the boss. So through their schooling, they were encouraged, as I say, to be the people that would be, make decisions, to be the people that would be in authority. And the ways in which Bowles and Gintis talked about this was, was very much about the actual experiences, relationships between people, as opposed to the official curriculum that we, we might normally associate with education, um, sometimes called the hidden curriculum. And I started to look at the interviews. Well, in fact, it almost came naturally because as I was listening to the men talk about their schooling and describe their experiences from as early as primary school, Given my experience working in prisons as a, as a prison educator, some of their experiences immediately I recognise as experiences that they have in prison. Probably one of the most clear examples of this was that more than one of the men talked about being in school and being um, isolated and restricted to particular areas of the school. So one um, man in particular talked about sitting outside the headmaster's office practically every day of a certain period of his schooling against, a, there was a desk against a wall at which he sat and he described that as being his desk. He would sit um, for hours on end with very little meaningful educational content. So perhaps copying from a book or writing lines, this kind of activity. He wouldn't be um, permitted to go outside for playtime, to, to play with his peers. He wouldn't be able to move freely around the school without a staff escort because of fears of, for him, um, concerns about him uh, getting into fights or other um, type of activity. And in one case, he described what his, what his words were, he was let out for good behaviour and he was permitted to go into the school playground with the skipping rope. Um, by the way, I might not have said this is a primary school. So this is a, a, a description of a, um, somebody's primary school experience. That the teacher drew a square on the floor in chalk and said that he could stand in that square and, and skip in that square, but he wasn't allowed to come out of that boundary. I remember this interview, this aspect of the interview in particular, not only because that's obviously quite disturbing when you hear somebody talking about um, this kind of experience at school, but also the, the, just the stark parallels of the experience of being in prison where you are, you know, often isolated with little meaningful activities to do by yourself. Access to outside space is very limited. It's, you know, occasionally um, depending on the regime and we talk about COVID at the moment and the restrictions of regimes as COVID in prison mean that there's even less activity going on on wings and outside but this going outside and standing in a square just reminded me so much of men going out for exercise in prison and, and walking around a square yard and this felt not just like a metaphor but actually a direct parallel between the two experiences. And if we go back to Bowles and Gintis, and what Bowles and Gintis say is, the way that working class children are schooled prepares them to fit into this role in the future, in the unequal society that we have that has different classes of people, pay different amounts, with different differing amounts of power within that system. Part of their argument is that that preparation through schooling allows them to fit into this unequal structure without complaint and without resistance because they are ready for it, they're expecting it. They've been told over and over that this is your place and this is how you will live within this. Even though those aren't explicit messages in the same way that, you know, pi r squared is how, how you do a circle. Is that right? I've just said that as if that's the right thing. Yeah, so... It's not explicit, although sometimes it is. Sometimes teachers do literally say to children, if you don't 
book your eyes up, Johnny, you will and you'll find yourself ending up in prison. But actually, it's more this subtle set of expectations and set of narratives around and literal physical experiences that support those narratives that for Bowles and Gintis is was preparing working class children to occupy working class positions and again as I say without complaint with expectation and also within those roles kind of I wouldn't go as far to say feel happy but to um, not challenge either the, the role that they find themselves with or how it compares to others. And so I looked at coming from the interviews and what people were saying about their experience of school and, and seeing how in the same way their experiences were potentially preparing them for what it was like to be in prison. So if they then do find themselves in prison, and there's other research, which is not my research, and there's lots of it that suggests that very negative outcomes in school increase the likelihood of offending, therefore increase the likelihood of imprisonment. If that is happening um, elsewhere, and there are a lot of correlations, this extra bit of preparation that I'm describing, that the men described and that is, you know, kind of borrowing from Bowles and Gintis, this is... This is an element of the school to prison pipeline, if you, if you like, that perhaps had not been considered previously. And so, yeah, this, this was my main argument that it's the experiences themselves that are doing something that by the time um, men, men get to prison, they are ready for it and therefore able to cope with it better than they might have done otherwise. And it might, might, might also have something to do with the high levels of um, recidivism post custody, because actually it's not as an effective deterrent as you might imagine, because just like working class kids going to work in factories in the industrial age when there were those kinds of jobs, yeah, there, it, there isn't necessarily the resistance ultimately to this thing that feels like an incredibly harsh punishment to somebody who isn't actually able to do it easily. I guess my argument is that before they even become incarcerated, they have been experiencing a kind of incarceration in other spaces for many, many years. So all of this is incredibly helpful. What, what you're arguing, I think, I mean, firstly, the state spends billions of pounds a year on on sending children to these spaces schools um, and what what you've argued is that it doesn't just do that to teach them maths and history and English but also teach them this hidden curriculum about knowing their place uh, and preparing them for being the subject of different uh, levels of authority I think it's really helpful just interested in what you think about how particularly particular children are singled out there feels like there's this kind of collateral damage thing that happens if you if you misbehave then you're going to end up like the kid that's going to be sent da -da -da. is that what's going on or are there other things that are going on there did you did you discover or, or subsequently okay so <clears throat> The statistics tell us that there are particular types of children that this is more likely to happen um, with. So it's more likely that it will be boys, for instance. It's more likely that it will be ethnic minority children, especially black children and especially black boys. Um, but, but actually, it doesn't require particular groups to be in the classroom for this to happen. So this usefully links to another theorist that I found helpful in thinking these things through, which was is Foucault. And um, Foucault talks about um, dis disciplinary power, the power of disciplining, and um, this concept of um, Keith, help me out. Uh, this is my age. I can't draw words from. Oh my God! I don't this understand Suko. <laughs> What's the um the prison the the, the, oh, the panopticum? Oh, for God's sake! You... Oh, I could have got that right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we might keep this in. But, all right. Okay. 
that took on yes yeah. so this yeah. this idea that and this was involved in prison design as well um bentham's prison that actually if, if we could convince people that they are being surveyed that they are being watched that they are being judged all of the time what will happen is they will self-regulate they will they will decide to not do a particular behavior that is um that has been positioned as undesirable so the reason i make this link is because arguably in a classroom if we want to let me think about how to relate this back to what i was saying before what i started to think about is why is this happening to just a certain like not just who but only a certain number of children in school and what um what function is this performing so when the men were telling me about the different things that they used to get in trouble for in primary school they were very 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 minor infractions if you like they were not throwing chairs at teachers um, or bringing knives into school for instance they were normally just um you know not saying not staying silent when the teacher asked them to be silent or speaking out of turn or offering an opinion that hadn't been asked for and and what also came across is a sense that other people did these things but they were the only ones that would be pulled up on these things and again leaning on sociological theory there are arguments there are there are a number of arguments that actually if we can um in terms of this function that can be quite quite often argued that comes through education of socializing and saying what are the um, accepted norms of behavior if we can identify a um a deviant so who, who is not following the rules um visibly sanction that person who is not following the rules the aim is not actually to change that person's behavior but to mean that everybody else in the classroom first of all is more likely to follow the behavior standards but for me i think more importantly what it does is is legitimizes the authority of the teacher it legitimizes this idea that there are particular people or particular forms of behavior that are um, sanctionable or punishable so that one person is punished repeatedly for minor things it keeps all of the rest of the people in the classroom kind of compliant and potentially quiet but as those children go through school and then become adults later on the idea of certain kinds of behaviors being legitimately punishable is is implanted which allows us to have systems like prisons because that seems okay if we have this idea that we can legitimately punish people for their behaviors in in particular kinds of ways and it also legitimizes in those people that are at a different point in the hierarchy in the system the kind of system of inequalities that we have in society that their position is legitimate that the person who was excluded from school and ends up going to prison later on um, kind of deserves that that they deserve let's assume we take the two extremes of um kind of class-based or individually based inequality in in any given country that you'll have people kind of who are earning the most amount of money have the most amount of freedom and and power often if you look at those people individually or the class from which they come they have had a certain type of education that again potentially if you look at it in terms of outcomes looks better because they you know might have better a level results or you know good results from prestigious universities but actually what they also have is a sense of their position in the social hierarchy is very legitimate because they have been legitimized through the education system so they have come to earn their position as very well paid lawyer or you know senior politician they have earned those through their experience through schooling which has told them yes you you know you've done well at school you followed the rules you've earned this position 
And at the other end of the scale, those that have you know, been excluded from um, maybe the, the least well-resourced state schools in the country, that if they then go on to find themselves in a position where they are impacted by the criminal justice system, that also seems legitimate to everybody on the strata, including those the, the people themselves involved, not just people looking on. And I think that that beginning punishing experience in school is a real significant part that shapes people's identities, but also legitimizes, as I say, this kind of deserving, non-deserving binary in terms of both privilege and punishment. I just wanted to draw the, the students back to some stuff we looked at a few weeks ago, uh, French and Ravens work around different forms of power. I mean, they talk about uh, legitimate power as, as one of those forms. And I think what you've really uh, helpfully done is to start to really critique how people find themselves in positions where they're the power that they have, the power and privilege they have, doesn't just na come naturally, but actually it comes as a result of a whole set of systems that are put in place in order to preference certain groups of people above others. I think that's really uh, useful. It's also worth thinking about the, the work of Wilkinson and Pickett and also indeed uh, Danny Dawling too, where they talk about the way in which unequal societies, societies where there's a greater gap between the very rich and, and the very poor, uh, there are higher rates of incarceration in those countries. Um, and I think that's a really useful thing for just to remind people of as well. And indeed also what you've helpfully said as well is that uh, there are particular then groups of people who find themselves incarcerated um, above others as well. And that's really helpful. And as you were talking about those sort of school practices, it's worth, again, this is this is to the audience really, thinking about uh, those particular groups of, of students who find themselves at that kind of that collateral end, certainly from the work that I'm very interested in around children with care experience, uh, they would be another group of, of children who, who are often singled out um, as troubled, troublesome, uh, problem children, problem children, quote unquote, uh, and and often find themselves in the gaze of of uh, pr professionals within education uh, in order to do that. As I'm sort of talking, do you think uh, this is just because teachers are bastards, or is there some other thing that's going on here that creates that? No, I don't think that, though I'm sure that some are, right? Because, <laughs> because you'll find people who are not great at their jobs in every job. But I think generally, no, it's not that. I think, first of all, to say that um, teachers themselves have been produced by the very system in which they teach. So they have themselves gone through a schooling experience that gave them messages about what is the appropriate way to behave, to think, to present, what is education for? And unless they, for whatever reason, have had potentially individual experiences to help them to challenge that notion. And, and if they leave that unchallenged and untroubled, they, they are completely forgiven for reproducing the same system that reproduced them and also importantly made them legitimate. So as teachers at the front of a classroom, to understand their position as legitimate, need, you know, to a large extent would need to, to believe the system themselves in which they work is legitimate. And this is something that I have to say is, is not an easy thing to do. You know, I'm an educator, I have been an educator for some time and, and not in schools, but that, you know, in universities and in other spaces. And it is a dilemma for someone like myself who understands what education can do in terms of, it, you know, education in its real sense is always empowering and always promotes growth. 
but there are aspects of systemic schooling and education that, that aren't that, honestly. So at a university level, you know, the whole academic language that we are expecting people to be inducted into and then use is very exclusionary, very problematic. And to, to kind of use those tools in a way that can support people to grow is a challenge when, when at the same time I know that actually there's something about that that's absolute complete bollocks. We shouldn't have to know all these big words in order to be able to express what, how we understand the world. So coming back to this question about practitioners, whether they're in schools or universities or elsewhere, they are likely operating under the same, you know, influence than operating under this kind of idea of the legitimacy of what they're doing, because they themselves have been schooled and continue to be schooled. You know, professional practice and expectations that come from places like Ofsted, for instance, and other things, it continue this kind of messaging that says particular types of children may be a problem for instance as you've just described particular ways of monitoring and controlling and um, assessing behavior is something that is taught to teachers in terms of their training is reinforced constantly through you know bodies like Ofsted People may even feel in um, risk of losing their jobs if they don't follow particular behaviour strategies that are brought in by um, senior leaders. And, you know, most often I would suggest from my experience of being a parent that sends children to school and different teachers that I've known is that they actually have the best interests of the pupils at heart when they do these things. They, they you know, if you look at schools... Um, that serve I'm always worried about which word to use here so the kind of words that I've come across in reading literature about groups are things like disadvantaged or disenfranchised and all of these things not words that I'm particularly happy with because they suggest a a deficit away from the standard or the norm but but, but for brevity I guess the students will know the kind of groups that I'm referring to so if if and I say that again because I come from those groups so it, it's it's something that isn't so easy for me to say that definition or that way of talking about a group is fine because anyway sorry I digress um if you look at a lot of schools um who serve particular kinds of populations you will find a lot of emphasis on behavior management a lot more emphasis on behavior management and controlling even of appearance, a lot of controlling of appearance, a lot of messaging that suggests the communities or the families from which you come are not equipping you well enough for the world ahead. And now we need to correct that somehow. You know, they become a, an early department of corrections before people move on to other types possibly later on. And again, most teachers in those situations are doing that because they genuinely believe that that will help the children in the future. If they, if they adhere to particular behavior standards and the call, then they are more likely to get the other outcomes, such as, you know, five GCSEs at, at grade, um, whatever the equivalent is to A to C now, because it's numbers, um, that, that that real focus on behaviour is really, really important. But actually, again, coming back to my research, what I found was that once the, these particular men had been subject to behavioural behavior, um, monitoring and this gaze that you described, actually their education took a back seat. There wasn't so much emphasis on on learning maths and English and science. Instead, there was just a constant focus on their behavior, their appearance, what they did, controlling their bodily movements around the school, all of those kind of things. And actually their education, the, the development of knowledge 
was yeah it, it that was that took second place if if featured at all actually and again teachers in that position and I've seen these arguments they are under a great deal of pressure I mentioned Ofsted and other things with league tables all kinds of things that mean that they have a difficult job with a large number of children in a class that they're trying to get through their SATs or their GCSEs or something similar and if there are children in the classroom who are behaving outside of what has has come to be understood as the legitimate way to present in school they see that as a massive disruption on what they are there to do which is those other things that I've just described and so even if they think and I have spoken to teachers who think this they know that excluding a child from a, a classroom or from the school altogether doesn't necessarily do that child much good what it does do they they believe is to help the other the other children in the class and so they can justify it from that point of view so yeah this might not be good for Johnny who's been excluded but but you know I've got a class of 30 children and I need to kind of think of the the greater good in this case so yeah so no I don't think teachers are um, what you said <laughs> that's very helpful what what you're arguing I think is um that these these things are baked into the system this stuff is systemic uh, and it's worth again for the audience just to think about uh, Thompson's PCS analysis where he says that discrimination and oppression functions at, at three separate yet interrelated levels at the personal cultural and the structural so it's within the culture of the school it's within the culture of the teaching profession it's not just a personal thing and it's within the policy framework and the legislation that exists around schools so it's also structural it's all very deeply baked in one of the things i was also just thinking about while you were talking a little bit earlier was this very clear distinction um, between education and schooling and i think that was just worth really highlighting for People who are watching this too we're we're not talking about education i think uh, karen said earlier that education uh is is a universal good and it's uh it's empowering and it's about growth um it's it's the schooling that's the issue the way that we're schooling people and i would encourage people on that basis to uh, have a look at the work of ivan illick or ivan illich uh, de-schooling education is a really interesting uh, book Karen's off your screen at the moment but she's nodding with me uh, and also some of these ideas uh, have really been uh, propagated by the works of Paolo Freire as well in his in particular his book Pedagogy of the Oppressed so again that's something that's really useful to look at I think all of these kind of ideas are sort of flowing around um, and I it, just inter interrupt with another reading recommendation please um, yeah um after Freire in particular with bell hooks teaching to tra transgress in particular but other work um she did a, quite a bit of work with Freire and yeah she she talks about those dilemmas as a practitioner it's been really helpful for me as an educator to think about how you can be within a system that has all these problems but use you know but in that system think about ways of challenging challenging it from within that's really helpful. That kind of brings me on to my next question, which was really about the the kind of context today. Some of those practices. What does that? What does this mean? Why is this stuff important for practitioners? Why is it important for policymakers? So the example that you used right at the very start was this idea about isolation. I know through conversations with you that you share my deep discomfort with the widespread use of isolation units and rooms within schools. Um, I, I think they are deeply problematic. I think they are abusive and a breach of human rights. That's my position. That's where I stand on them. And, and I think for all the reasons that you've uh, mentioned earlier, um, in terms of the way that it's, it, it kind of mirrors the, the segregation units within schools, I think is a really helpful, uh, sorry, within prisons is a really helpful Sort of parallel that, that your research highlighted so given that we've established that it's not 
just because teachers are bad, but there's this there's this kind of wider policy and indeed political in in the kind of the big P sense. That there's this kind of wider set of political issues. My sense is that certainly in recent years, this higher emphasis on behaviour and and performing has has kind of increased, and and there's been a number of high profile government appointments over the past couple of years of people who are really in favour of this. Indeed, there's an educator who's just been um, given a job as they. Uh, social mobility czar uh, from the government who tweeted just recently that they believe that all children are born evil and it's our job to school the evil out of them, which is quite a remarkable statement to be made by the current social mobility czar. So we're in this kind of political environment at the moment, and I'm feeling a little bit hopeless about it. So no pressure. Have you got any hope to give? Um, or kind of anything to say to professionals and uh, policymakers within this? I mean, the first thing to say, before I get to the hope thing, and I do have some hope actually, is when you were talking about the current moment, um, it reminded me of Stuart Hall's work, Police in the Crisis, which was is, is specifically about policing, but, you know, arguably what we're talking about in schools is policing as well. It's a different type of policing, you know, um, sending people to detention and isolation rooms and all of this kind of thing and giving people records for their school behaviour is, is a form of policing. And one of the arguments, an enduring and very well-made argument from policing the crisis is, in times like this, real, serious social crisis, you know, what we have at the moment in terms of you know, everything, if we just talk about the UK, you know, the problems that are happening in the economy as a result of Brexit, you know, the pandemic, all kinds of other things are coming together at the moment where scrutiny may well start to fall on those in power in terms of their decision making around a number of things that in times of high crisis such as that. So the air, the timing that um, Stuart Hall looked at was, you know, during similar times of real crisis in the 80s, there, there often becomes a real focus on controlling a, 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 a group of people in different areas. So if it, if it might be young people who are carrying knives, for instance, in London, you will get, a, a, or, or other inner city areas, you will, you, you will suddenly hear a lot of policies around that a lot of concern around that, a lot of media coverage around that, and, and then potentially laws come in to change. And this becomes touted as one of the most serious problems that are happening in the country at the moment. You have similar things that you're describing in schools, you have other areas, you know, in other areas of public life where there is a massive focus suddenly on potentially imagining a problem or making a problem much bigger than it than it statistically is versus other problems and then coming up with very very harsh solutions to those problems that arguably have been either completely entirely imagined or have been exaggerated to move the focus away from the real problems where they are i mean obviously at the moment covid in particular has put a great deal of pressure on educators teachers in schools in particular and potentially at the moment you might have an environment where teachers actually consider doing education differently because the amount of pressure that's been put on them recently it, there's a there's a potential here for um i wouldn't go as far to say a revolution but the circumstances are so on the tip of a crisis that actually if if we label and we have a, an emphasis on um, another area of schooling, for instance, or another area of education, it, it, it shifts the focus. So I would say that when we see those things happening to think about, well, what, why, why is there a big attempt all of a sudden to shift that focus? And what, what, are, what are people trying to avoid in terms of looking at what potentially are the real issues, the real concerns uh, that teachers or other people in education might have? 
And so that does bring me to the hope part. As I've just said, I think, I think in times of real dire crisis that we are arguably at the moment, there is, first of all, the potential for people to see things differently. And, and I have, um, over the years, spoken to a number of educators who actually are very concerned with, for example, racial disproportionality in school exclusions or school exclusions generally and the fact that they're rising, racial disproportionality aside, and actually don't, and you know, there are a group of educators campaigning against, you know, exclusions entirely. And I think in, in times like these in particular, but at any time, exposing educators with these views to the types of knowledge, and this is why it's so concerning that some of this knowledge is locked within universities and in terms of the books are and the language and all of those kinds of things, because with a greater understanding of the systemic nature of, of what's happening in schooling, I think most educators would practice differently and they would feel empowered to do so, especially if connected with other educators also with the similar with a similar view. And I have been invited, for instance, to speak to groups of educators who are part of an education union around these issues. There is an appetite for for practitioners frustrated, sometimes it comes from frustrated in their own role first, to then think about how they might practice differently in order to both improve their, their own job, but also the, the lot of the, the, uh, their clients, if you like. And I would say this across most professions, not just teaching. So this, this, you know, this, this could apply to um, people working in the criminal justice system, social work, frankly any profession that is in the business of shaping people's lives or is in the position of influencing especially young people where they might might end up that there there is potentially an appetite to do things differently amongst that profession and you know you and I are part of that and you know, as educators, the more that we can potentially inform future pr practitioners, so those might be the students that are listening to this now, to think about how they may, within their roles, and this is where, again, you know, someone like Bell Hooks, reading Bell Hooks is particularly useful, thinking about how we can be empowered to transgress within our profession and create even in day-to-day -day interactions as a start, but also in terms of how this might influence um, changes in more wider scale policy in the future. You know, students are now are potentially the education secretary, you know, in 10 years time or whatever. Yeah, there is, there is hope. If, if, if you and I can have a conversation like this and others can listen to it and, and think, yeah, and that can be parents as well as practitioners. If parents can listen and think, actually, do I think that this way that my children and, and their peers are being educated is legitimate? Is there a different way? Is there a way that is less about sorting people into different positions on this um, hierarchy and hoping that your child, child is towards the top rather than towards the bottom? but actually challenging this, this system of hierarchy in the first place as illegitimate and, and ultimately not serving any of us. You know, education should be about enabling new souls that come into the world to have creative responses to, to the world that we're in, rather than telling them, this is, what, this is what we do, this is the system you're going to slot into, this, these are the these are the breaks. These are the things that you're going to gain. These are the things that you're going to lose. No, what are your ideas? What can you bring to a new world? So we can imagine it entirely. I mean, this is quite revolutionary, but that so that we can imagine it entirely differently to how we do now. I am actually quite hopeful about that. 
and maybe, for, you know, not our generation, but the generation that is currently going through schooling and has just had a year or so of, actually, you don't have to come to school to go to school. These kind of ideas that go, well, actually, you don't have to. That thing that we said to you before that you have to do, otherwise the world's going to fall apart. We didn't do any of that and we still managed to do things. So maybe the generation that is coming through schooling now and has and the teachers that are teaching now, this break due to COVID potentially has given space to go, well, can we imagine things differently? Because look, we just did things entirely differently to what we were doing the month before. Keith, I feel a bit depressed now because I'm not sure whether, I don't know, that sounds all very hopeful, but then immediately after saying those things, you kind of think of all the weight and all the history and all the things that suggest it will be something else. Sure. sure. I suppose the question then, isn't it? This isn't for you. This is for those watching, really, is that how do you deal with this stuff? Do you subvert things within the system in order to improve things? Or do you try and overturn the system itself? And, um, you know, those are those are the sort of questions that should that should occupy our our thinking uh, quite a lot. So, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't feeling terribly depressed from what you were saying then. I was, you were, you were giving me nuggets of hope. Um, and I think also, like you said, uh, there are lots of practitioners who are sensing this, that there's something that's not right about the way that school is being done and that it, then that it needs to change. And I think, I think the, the more that we can, Build and develop those networks amongst us also of, of like-minded people because it can be lonely to be in an environment where you're the only one in the staff room that actually is, is kind of thinking these things against that really kind of big culture of, of performing and and uh discipline and all those kind of really sort of dominant discourses that fly around society and within schools more of those microcosms so yeah maybe there is hope i think what you're just saying there is really really key um you may be lucky enough to go to work somewhere whatever role that you do and you meet somebody like-minded and on the same as, as keith and i did in, a, in an office together in university um and you may not, um, but there are people that that will want to even have those discussions elsewhere. And I guess it's seeking those out to to support you, um, both in terms of your thinking, but that that sense of being overwhelmed by. I mean, even as I said all those hopeful things afterwards, it, it, you know, it's, it's hard to push back the the systemic, overwhelming sense of history and experience to date to keep that hope um so to do that alone is is incredibly difficult so you know sometimes reading can help because it's not somebody physically that you can speak but it's somebody that you can see is written on a piece of paper and that's what helped me when I was doing my doctorate I had these ideas but then came across these ideas in books that were very similar to mine and that was incredibly empowering um, because I thought, oh, it's not just me that's seen this. There were, there were a series of people and, and over some time. So a lot of the work that I used to support my thesis was written, you know, in the 80s, in the 90s, before that. There's something about that that was also quite empowering. It made me realise that this is, this has been, and people have been saying this, and people have been saying this for some time. Um, so this is not, these are not necessarily new ideas. That being the case, along with the ideas, if you can meet other people that also support those ideas and think, and you can develop, you can build on those ideas as I did and bring those ideas to other people. So, so that journey that I've described of building on, first of all, my practical experience of teaching in a prison with the words of others that have written about these kinds of things before, I came up with a version of that. And then I have since worked with students who have built on some of my work and others in the same way and and you know that momentum can build in terms of developing ideas 
and then the more those ideas are spread amongst others it can actually impact on practice also I had an email once from a student I hadn't taught but had studied at the same university at Manchester Met saying that they had read my work and they were about to go into their um, teaching practice their teaching year their qualifying teaching year and having read my work they had really thought very very differently about what kind of practitioner they were going to be and they were thanking me they were like I, I had never thought of this before having read this it has really opened my eyes to something that I hadn't previously seen and now I've seen it there's no way that I'm going to be able to perpetuate some of those things that you describe so that for me gives me massive hope sometimes you know when I'm the bits of work that I'm doing feels quite lonely feels like well what difference is this going to make but at least one person has reached out to me and said and and said that and then they potentially are going to impact on several other people and you know it goes on and I think perhaps uh, Keith earlier you said you know it, the question is do we subvert from within or from or or try to change a system from without each of us will have various opportunities in our professional life to do either or or a bit of both and it, I guess knowing that means that there will be times when you feel like you can take those opportunities and there's times that realistically you can't but maybe it's not an either or maybe it's a bit of both or timing or support that you have to do it but these are all the potential spaces in which we could be making a difference as current practitioners and future practitioners. That's great. Thank you, Karen. What I'll also do, I'm going to put a link to uh, the article that you've just referred to that that student read. I'll put that to the bottom of this um, on the YouTube page. I think that's been really helpful. Thank you so much for your time today, Karen. I've, as ever, found it uh, incredibly challenging and stimulating and hopeful indeed. So thanks so much for your time and I uh, hope you all enjoyed it.